Hi everyone, Nurse Jenny here from Nurse Life Academy, and I will be reviewing questions and concepts related to MIs or myocardial infarctions that you must know for the CCRN exam. In these review questions, we'll get more familiar with reading 12 lead EKGs, it's not that bad, I promise, and understanding which infarcts are associated with which coronary arteries. I will time mark this video, so feel free to just scroll through at your own pace, but I do give extra information and explanations after every question to really reinforce the content. I would greatly appreciate it if you liked and subscribed to my video if you found it helpful. Without further ado, let's get started. Before we start with question number one, I quickly wanted to review some basics, and I wanted all of us to just be on the same page when it comes to MIs. So we all know that our heart is perfused by our two main arteries. You have your RCA or your right coronary artery, and you have your left main coronary artery or your LMCA. Now, when we have cardiac ischemia, it means that blood flow to the cardiac muscle tissue has decreased, which can lead to poor oxygen supply or hypoxia. And you can live with ischemia, such as in coronary artery disease, and it can certainly limit your life in certain ways, or it can lead you to higher risks of many health problems, including MI, but it can be managed with medications and lifestyle changes. However, myocardial infarction means that the blood flow is completely cut off, which results in that ST elevation, and it results in cellular death of the affected part of the heart muscle. When those cells do not receive the oxygen that they need, they die and they will not come back or heal. So long story short, both are bad, but the myocardial infarction is what leads to that irreversible injury to those muscular cells of the heart and many adverse sequelae. Now I know all of you have seen an EKG before, and you've probably handed it off to the doctor after briefly looking at the top interpretation to make sure that there wasn't anything serious going on. Well, next time that your patient has an EKG, my hope is that you're able to look at it and understand what it is that you're actually looking at. So simply put, an EKG is just a snapshot looking at the electrical signals of the heart from multiple different angles. And if you know how to do a 12 lead EKG, that is great, but rest assured, you don't have to know how to do an EKG in order to understand this content. And we're not trying to be cardiologists here, so I'm gonna try to make it very simple. Question number one. Your patient is having ST elevation in most of his precordial leads and some ST depression in half of his limb leads. The patient is most likely experiencing an infarction of which wall of his heart? Is it A, posterior wall, B, right ventricular wall, C, anteroseptal wall, or D, inferior wall? All right, so I know what you're thinking. Oh my goodness, I have no idea which leads are which. It's all good, let me break it down for you. In a 12 lead EKG, you have 12 leads. Six of them are precordial and six of them are limb leads. And your precordial leads lie on your precordium, which is just a super fancy word for part of your torso. More specifically, it is the anterior chest wall over the heart. So the precordial leads are simply the ones that we put over the heart they're going to be leads V1 through V6. So if V1 through V6 are precordial leads, then the other six leads must be the limb leads. Limb leads are just what they sound like. They are leads that go on the limbs. So they're placed on the arms and the legs of the individual. And the six limb leads are called 1, 2, 3, AVF, AVL, and AVR. Now, when we're looking at an EKG, the limb and precordial leads are split in half directly down the EKG, so they make it nice and easy for us. So we have one, two, three, AVF, AVL, and AVR are our limb leads, and then our precordial leads are V1 through V6. 
Sorry, I went off on a little tangent there, but back to our question. So we have ST elevation in most of our precordial leads. Precordial, we're thinking precordium, aka our torso. So we know that we're dealing with leads V1 through V6 here. And we have ST depression happening in half of our limb leads. So those are the leads 1, 2, 3, AVF, AVL, AVR. The first thing I want you to know is that ST elevation trumps ST depression. So while ST depression may represent some kind of myocardial ischemia, when you have both ST elevation and ST depression on a question, the ST elevation is going to be more indicative of a total blockage of a coronary artery. ST depression might just be some reciprocal changes to that ST elevation, or it could be other factors such as hypokalemia or certain medications. So going back to the question, we're going to be looking more closely at our ST elevation in our precordial leads or our leads V1 through V6. Now, in order to answer this question, you need to know which leads go with which wall of the heart. So which wall of the heart is most likely to be damaged if we see ST elevation in most of V1 through V6? Why don't we look at a picture together? This picture is leads V1 through V6 as if you were standing on a ladder and looking down at their head. So V1 and V2 are the septal leads. V3 and V4 are anterior leads. V5 and V6 are some of the lateral leads. Well, it looks like I see anteroseptal as an answer here. So that would make up most of the ST elevation we see in his precordial leads. And it makes sense that we would have ST depression in half of his limb leads since an anteroseptal MI would have reciprocal changes or ST depression in 2, 3, and AVF. I know that was a lot of information and that this question was hard, but if you can answer this question, you are able to really critically think through it. And we're going to get you there. Don't worry. We're going to practice a lot of this information as we keep going. Here is my beloved MI chart. You guys need to know which walls of the heart are associated with which leads you would see ST elevation in. You want to know which coronary artery is affected and what the most common complications are of each. All right, moving on to question number two. A patient has ST elevation in leads 1, AVL, and V5 through V6. The patient is experiencing an infarction of which wall of the heart? Is it A, posterior wall, B, lateral wall, C, anterior wall, or D, inferior wall. And the answer is B, the lateral wall. This question is pure memorization. If you have not memorized which walls of the heart are associated with which leads of elevation, consider this a friendly reminder to do so. Okay, so we keep talking about ST elevation, but what is the actual definition of ST elevation and what does it look like? In order to understand ST elevation, we need to find what's called the J point. The J point is at the end of the QRS complex and it's at the beginning of the ST segment. So it is right here. In a normal EKG, the J point should return back to baseline after the QRS complex, such as it does here. So we can draw a straight line from the PR segment and the ST segment, and it returns completely back to baseline. It is a straight line through. So in this next picture, let's find our J points. Our first J point is going to be right here. And we see that after the QRS complex, it goes back to baseline because we can draw a straight line from the PR segment 
to the ST segment. So that looks good. Now let's find the J point on the right side here. Well, it doesn't return back to that baseline. If we draw a straight line from the PR segment through, it actually is quite elevated from it. This is what's considered ST elevation. It occurs when the J point is displaced above that baseline. So here we see our one EKG beat with our two dotted lines. The dotted line on the bottom is where our ST segment should have been if we had a normal strip. Because remember, we're drawing a straight line from that PR segment. But the dotted line on top shows us that we are two boxes above our baseline. So this is considered ST elevation. Each small box is one millimeter. So in this example, if there are two small boxes, that will be equal to two millimeters. And according to the American Heart Association guidelines for STEMIs, for a STEMI to be considered a STEMI, there must be new greater than one millimeter ST segment elevation at the J point in at least any two contiguous leads except leads V2 or V3, where the elevation must be two millimeters in men or 1.5 millimeters in women. You don't need to memorize that, but I would generally know that greater than one millimeter or that one small box elevation in two contiguous leads is considered a STEMI. And contiguous means next to each other in sequence. So V5, V6, V3, V4, 1, 2 are all examples of two contiguous leads. On the CCRN, ST elevation is going to be obvious. They are not going to have you sit down with your little protractor and ruler and measure out this one millimeter. You will see that ST elevation or the question will tell you that there is ST elevation somewhere. So you will need to know what ST elevation is associated with which wall of the heart, what coronary artery is affected, and what the common complications are. I promise that's the last time I'm going to say that. Question number three, what is your interpretation? All right, so let's look for some ST elevation here. I do apologize as I know that this is a little bit small, especially if you're watching this on your phone, but let's take a look for our J points here. And I like to start with leads two, three, and AVF. We are starting with lead two here. It's on the middle left side here. So let's draw that line from our PR segment straight across. And let's find our J point now. I know it's difficult to see, but I see about one millimeter of ST elevation. So we'll just make a note of that right now. Okie dokes. So we're going to move on to lead number three next. We're going to draw that line from our PR segment straight across. And it looks like that J point is above the baseline that we drew. So here we certainly have ST elevation. All right. So, so far we have ST elevation in two leads and two contiguous leads. So leads two and three. Remind me again, what is the last lead that we want to look at? It's going to be AVF. We group the three of these together. And it looks like our AVF lead also has the slightest bit of ST elevation here too. So we're noting this down too, but we will go through the rest of the EKG. Next, we're going to go to V1 and V2. And V1 looks pretty normal to me. V2 maybe has a little bit of ST depression, so we'll just keep that in our back pocket. Next, we're going to move on to V3. That looks normal. And V4, that looks pretty good. V5 and V6, that looks good too. 
And last but certainly not least, we're going to go to leads one, which looks good, and AVL, which has some ST depression. Remember, ST elevation trumps ST depression. So we're really just going to focus on that ST elevation. And we did see it in actually three contiguous leads. It was leads two, three, and AVF. So which wall of the heart is this? It is C, the inferior wall of the heart. Again, memorize your leads and walls. Two, three, and AVF is the inferior wall of your heart. And we will see reciprocal changes such as ST depression in AVL. Usually we see the reciprocal changes in one and AVL. But this is an EKG from the early stages of an inferior infarct. So that's why you might not see as much of a pronounced ST change as others. I know I went over that a little bit quickly, but let's just go through an example that's not a question super quickly. So do you remember where we started our last question? When we get an EKG, we start with the inferior leads of the heart. Those are two, three, and AVF. The inferior wall of the heart is perfused by the right coronary artery. One other thing that I wanted to mention is that when you have an inferior wall infarction, you are also at higher risk for having a right ventricular infarction. And what leads would we see ST elevation in if we had a right ventricular infarct? We sometimes see ST elevation in lead V1, but more specifically, we would want to get that right-sided EKG and look at V2R through V4R. Keep that in your back pockets. We're gonna keep going with the EKG and we want to look at the septal wall of our heart next. So those are leads V1 and V2. This is supplied by the LAD. Next, we're looking at V3 and V4, which is the anterior wall of the heart, also supplied by the LAD. The lateral wall is represented by V5 and V6, which is supplied by the circumflex, which is a branch off of the left main coronary artery. And lastly, we will look at 1 and AVL, which is also the lateral wall, but it's just the high lateral wall. Again, we are not cardiologists here. We are going to group all of the lateral leads together. And for the purposes of the CCRN, we really don't need to worry about the AVR lead. Just of note, a lot of the times you'll get an EKG that has more than those 12 leads or the three main rows. Just look at the 12 leads, which are those top three lines. The extra stuff is just a continuation of certain leads. So in this EKG, there's just more information on lead two. Again, here is another example of an EKG with just more information than we need. We're just going to focus on the top three lines, which give us plenty of information about our 12 leads. So here there's just a continuation of leads V1, 2, and V5, but we can see them clearly up top, so we're not too worried about that. All right, question number four. A patient is experiencing active chest pain and his EKG shows ST elevation in leads V1 through V4. Which artery is most likely experiencing infarction? Is it A, the left anterior descending artery, B, the right coronary artery, C, posterior descending artery, or D, the circumflex artery? So V1 through V4, which wall of the heart are we looking at here? We're looking at the anteroseptal wall. And which artery supplies the anterior and septal walls of the heart? 
it is our left anterior descending artery or our LAD. When I was first trying to memorize which artery supplied what, I just kept getting everything confused because let's face it, there is so much to remember and cardiology is not easy. It wasn't until I looked at pictures of the heart that it honestly became so much easier and I wished I had done it from the beginning. So when we're talking about the inferior part of the heart, what are we really talking about? What are you imagining in your head? Because I know before I looked at pictures, I had no idea. Well, the inferior part of the heart is this part in green. So you can see that it's mostly on the right side of the heart. Remember, we're looking directly at the heart. So our lefts and our rights are going to be flipped. So the inferior part is some of that right side, and then it goes around the corner and it extends into the back there. Fair enough. Next, let's look at the septal wall of the heart. It's actually inside there with that yellow hue because the septum is the middle of your heart. Makes sense, right? Next, we have the anterior wall of the heart. So that is most of that front half there in that light blue. And in purple there, the lateral wall of the heart is shown. The picture doesn't show the posterior wall of the heart, but posterior means back. So it would be part of that back wall of the heart. So now when we're talking about all these different walls of infarct, you can actually visualize which part of the heart we're talking about. And let me just add one more step to this. I'm going to add this big obnoxious black line down the middle here. Why do you think that I did that? Well, what if I did this? What is this arrow pointing to here? Well, I don't know. It's some artery on the heart. Well, which side of the heart is it on? I guess it's on the right side of the heart, right? Remember, we're looking at it straight on. So if this artery is on the right side of the heart, well, it has to be either the right or the left coronary artery. It has to be the right coronary artery. That is our RCA. All right, let's try another one. Which artery is this one? Let's make it super simple. What side of the heart is it on? It is on the left side of the heart. So this is going to be our left main coronary artery or our LMCA. All right, we're going to keep going here. We're still on the left side here, so we know that much. That's a great start. And let me give you a hint. Look at that light blue part of the heart. Which heart wall is this? It is the anterior part of the heart. Aha. Uh -huh. So this must be our LAD or our left anterior descending artery. Last but not least, we can only see a little bit of it, but this is the artery that comes off of our left main coronary artery and it wraps around the heart into the back. And this is our circumflex artery. Honestly, it's not that bad. You have a right side of your heart, you have a left side of your heart, you have a right coronary artery, and you have a left coronary artery that branches off a little bit further. We're just going to look at a different picture, but I'm going to go over the same concept. So let's look at the inferior wall of the heart here. If you remember, in the last picture, it was that green that kind of started on the right side and it wrapped around the back. In this picture, it is this pretty turquoise color. So which artery supplies the inferior part of the heart? Well, we're looking at the right side of the heart here, so it is the RCA. 
So looking at this picture, does it make sense that an inferior wall MI has a greater risk of also developing a right ventricular infarction? Indeed, the RCA is supplying blood to that right ventricle, so it's totally possible. And if you look up at the chart on top, all it is is it's the three rows of the EKG leads that we would see on an EKG. And there you have the inferior wall, leads 2, 3, and AVF on the right side of the EKG. Now let's look at the anterior part of the heart, or that front of the heart. Which artery is supplying the anterior portion of the heart, or this nice little baby blue color? Well, it's the left anterior descending artery, as you can see here. And what chambers of the heart does it look like this LED perfuses here? Well, it looks like it perfuses that left atrium and the left ventricle, right? So it would make sense that if you had an anterior or anteroseptal infarct, that you are at higher risk of developing pump failure, aka heart failure, right? Heart failure is one of the most common complications after an anterior or anteroseptal infarcts, and it makes sense when you kind of connect all the dots here. And then when we look at our EKG up on top, that light blue color is our anterior leads, V3 and V4, which are on the left side of the heart. We're looking at the same view of the heart as before, but we're going to be looking at the septal and the lateral walls. The septal wall of the heart is in royal blue here. It's also on the left side of the heart and gets blood supply from the left anterior descending artery. You will commonly see anteroseptal infarcts together because they're both supplied by the LAD. And in the case of a septal wall infarct, you would see ST elevation in leads V1 and V2. The lateral wall of the heart is depicted by the light green here. It is supplied by the circumflex artery, which comes off of that left main coronary artery. And with lateral infarcts, there are four leads, which you could see ST elevation in. Those are leads V5 and V6 as well as 1 or AVL. And the lateral wall is supplied by the left side, although I know 1 and AVL are located on the right side of the EKG, so just keep that in mind. This is a picture of the posterior of the heart. So now our right will be our true right and our left will be left. But you can see how the inferior wall of the heart extends back into that posterior and its blood supply comes from that RCA. And in purple, which we haven't really talked about too much, but it is the posterior wall of the heart. I hope this information gives you all a better understanding of the heart, its vessels, and how they're affected by infarction. Question number five, what is your interpretation? Is this an inferior wall MI, a lateral wall MI, an inferior and right ventricular wall MI, or an inferior posterior wall MI? And the answer is C. It is an inferior and right ventricular wall MI. So again, we're starting with 2, 3, and AVF, and right away I see ST elevation in all three of those leads. So that definitely tells us we have an inferior wall MI on our hands. But remember, read all of the answer choices and look at the rest of the EKG because I also see ST elevation in a V4R. And remember, you're gonna see ST elevation in either V1 or V2 through V4R when you have a right ventricular wall MI. So whenever you have an inferior infarct, always keep that in the back of your head. Question number six. 
which lead best indicates signs of an RV wall infarction? Is it A, lead one, B, AVF, C, V1, or D, V4? The answer is C, it is V1. V1 is indicative of a right ventricular wall infarction or V2R through V4R. Don't confuse that with just your regular V4. Question number seven. What are we looking at here? Is this A, an anteroseptal wall MI, B, a septal wall MI, C, an inferior wall MI, or D, an anterolateral wall MI? Where are we going to start? We are starting with 2, 3, and AVF, which is our inferior wall here. Looks like maybe a wee bit of elevation in that second lead, but we do have ST depression in lead 3, and AVF looks fine, but we're not going to worry too much about that since there isn't ST elevation in two contiguous leads. All right, next, V1 and V2. V1 looks okay. V2 looks like we're starting to have some ST elevation here. Moving on to V3, V4. Okay, okay. Yep, ST elevation is bright as day here. So we're definitely seeing something in which wall of the heart leads V3 and V4 are our anterior leads. Next, we're looking at V5, V6. Okay, here we go. Definitely some more ST elevation. V5 and V6 represent which wall of the heart? They represent part of the lateral wall of the heart. And last but not least, we're going to look at our other lateral friends. Those are 1 and AVL. And we do see some ST elevation here as well. So let's put our ST elevations together here. We have an anterolateral wall MI. Question number eight. You would avoid preload reducers in a patient experiencing A, a posterior wall infarction, B, a lateral wall infarction, C, an anterior wall infarction, or D, a right ventricular wall infarction. The answer is D, a right ventricular wall infarction. You want to avoid preload reducers such as nitrates, diuretics, and morphine in people with right ventricular infarctions because they are preload dependent. If you don't know about this, watch the cardiology lecture that I have. That will give you a little bit more insight into this. Question number nine. What are we dealing with here? Is this an inferior right ventricular wall MI? an inferior lateral wall MI, an inferior posterior wall MI, or an anteroseptal lateral wall MI. Uh, all right, so where are we starting? We're starting with our inferior leads or leads 2, 3, and AVF. I do see some ST depression here, so we're just going to move on from that. V1, V2, our septal wall, definitely some ST elevation. V3, V4, our anterior wall. That's looking like a tombstone. That is marked ST elevation. 
V5, V6, part of our lateral wall, also ST elevation here. And lastly, 1 and AVL, ST elevation is noted. So we have ourselves here in anteroceptal and lateral wall MI. Question number 10. The patient in the previous question with the anteroceptal lateral wall MI has most likely infarcted which artery? Is it A, the RCA, B, the circumflex, C, the left main, or D, the LAD? I know everyone right now is trying to picture that heart that we talked about in the beginning. Here it is again. We have certainly infarcted our left main. So split that heart in two. The left main coronary artery is the artery that supplies all three of those walls of the heart. It wouldn't be the LAD just because that does not supply that lateral wall. Question number 11. Your patient quickly develops acute left-sided heart failure following a myocardial infarction. Which wall of the heart is most likely to have been the culprit? Is it A, the anterior septal wall, B, the lateral wall, C, the posterior wall, or D, the inferior wall? Again, you can think back to that picture. You have that left side of your heart, which is supplied by the left main coronary artery. You are looking at an anterior and septal wall infarct. Again, those are associated with heart failure the most. Question number 12. Based on the following EKG, your patient is most likely to develop A. Tachycardia B. Third degree heart block C. Second degree type 2 heart block or D. Heart failure The answer here is B. Third degree heart block. So what kind of MI are we looking at here? This is indeed a inferior wall MI. And patients with inferior wall MIs are at risk for developing third degree heart block. Question number 13. Your patient has a blockage of the left anterior descending artery or the LAD. You understand that this is serious because it has cut off blood flow to the following wall or walls of the heart. A. Anterior B. Septal C. Anterior and septal or D. Lateral The answer here is C anterior and septal are supplied by the LAD. Question number 14. Which type of heart block would you be most likely to expect if your patient had an anterior wall MI? Is it A, first degree AV block, B, second degree type 1, C, second degree type 2, or D, tachycardia? The answer here is C, second degree type 2, are most likely associated with anterior wall MIs. And question number 15. Your patient is having an acute anteroceptal STEMI and is becoming unstable. You understand that your highest priority is, is it A, Going to the cath lab for PCI, B, starting aspirin and Plavix, C, beginning oral anticoagulation, or D, 
drawing a troponin. The answer is A. You absolutely want to go to the cath lab. Your percutaneous intervention is going to be the most important priority. All right, you guys, we have made it to the end. If you liked the video or you found it helpful, please like and subscribe. I would greatly appreciate it. And let me know if you have any questions. I would be more than happy to help. Good luck to everyone that's taking their CCRN. You guys are absolutely capable of doing it. I know it. And thank you again, everyone, for watching. Nurse Jenny signing off for Nurse Life Academy. Have a good one.